of God's word from the book of Matthew. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and of every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. All people are like grass. And their beauty is like the flowers of the field. But the word of our God stands forever. You may be seated. So uh, in 2012, I had uh, an opportunity given to me to travel to Kuala Lumpur uh, in Malaysia and go get together with a group of youth pastors from around uh, the entire world. There was youth pastors represented from uh, six different continents, from 15 to 20 different countries, uh, countless different languages were spoken, and uh, it, Amazingly, most everybody had uh, learned English, at least at some level, to be able to communicate, so that was kind of cool. But it was such an amazing gathering as you got to see the bigness of the kingdom of God, and you got to see just how huge it really was. And then as we sat through the week, uh, there was moments when there were songs that were common that everybody knew, and there was moments when the worship leader just said, hey, sing and whatever your native tongue is. So you're sitting there singing, there's, you know, 50, 60 people, and I don't know, 10, 15 different languages were being spoken uh, simultaneously at one point during the week. There was a guy from Germany who was just learning English, and they said, hey, w- would you pray for us? And, uh, and from what I understand, I'm a good American, and I know precisely one language. Uh, but praying in a different language is a very big challenge. Uh, and so Marcus just kind of looked at him like, really? You want me to pray in English? And, and they went, what are you? no, 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 no. In the entire room, not another person in the room spoke German. And they looked at Marcus and they said, no, 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 just pray in German. And it was the coolest thing to experience Marcus praying in German. But as we went out, he had no idea what he was saying, but it was cool to be able to experience and you could hear the spirit of God working in it and through it. And as the week went about, we heard stories of a church in Uganda that was only about 10 or 12 years old at the time that had seen something like 20,000 people who had come to Christ over the life of their church. Uh, There was a church in Egypt on the square in Cairo that had been... uh, that had started a prayer meeting that as best as I recall and remember, they had started a Monday night prayer meeting that about 3,000 people came to. And over the years, it's been estimated that through visions and dreams and churches throughout Europe, or I'm sorry, throughout Egypt, that somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two million Muslims have converted to Christianity. We heard stories of just uh, many, many people coming to Christ. Uh, One of those at one of those places in South America was Brazil. And I remember we had, several years later, we had the opportunity to go on a mission trip to Brazil. And we're sitting in worship one Sunday morning, and, uh, and it's just this guy kind of in the middle of the service, this pastor gets up, does like a three or four minute gospel presentation. Then he does an altar call, and like 50 people come forward and accept Christ that morning. It was just this week and over these several years that I've been involved in that, it was just this overwhelming awe of what God is doing uh, in us and through us throughout the world. And oftentimes I hear some of those things. And when you hear those kind of, those just the, the numbers over the years have just are insane over the different things that we've heard And it's easy for us to have several different reactions. Some of us sit back and there's times where, man, I'm excited and I can cheer. And I'm so thrilled to what God is doing throughout the world. And there's other times where I go into cynic mode and I'm like, 
well, sure, yeah, maybe that's happening, but like, is it really real? I mean, you know, is this all just like fake or is it actually people, is it real genuine conversions? And man, how arrogant of me to begin to think that uh, God is not working in these amazing and huge different ways. Or maybe as we go, uh, as we go about it, it's easy, uh, it's easy for me to slide into like a whiny toddler, whiny teenager mode where I'm like, Jesus, why aren't you doing that here? I want to see big, amazing, huge things like that happen here. What, don't you love us? Don't you want to do things like that here? Come on, Jesus, work here like that. Or maybe, or maybe we can, maybe we can jump on the excuse train and be like, well, you know, that would be happening here, but, you know, maybe we're just a little bit too busy, or maybe there's just a little bit too much going on, or, or maybe, you know, we're just too, our culture and place is just too immoral, or there's too much this or too much that, and we can start to dive into all of these excuses. Or maybe there's something else. As I read this passage, And maybe that something else is that I'm missing something. I'm missing something that God is doing. I'm missing the way that God is working and the way that God is transforming. And I'm just a jealous person who thinks it's better over there. It's better in that place. It's better someplace else. God's just not working here the same way. But as I read scripture, I don't see that. I don't see that at all. As we read this verse From the end of Matthew 9, and as Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. What I begin to see is that Jesus equips and sends us to the harvest. Jesus equips and Jesus sends us to the harvest. And so so what I begin to see, what I begin to realize in that passage, or in this passage, is that Jesus equips us. Jesus has already equipped you and me. If you've been a believer for any period of time whatsoever, believe it or not, you've already been equipped to go out into the harvest. Because as you get to know Jesus, and Jesus looks at his disciples in this passage, and, uh, and he begins to tell them various different things. But, but what Jesus has done before this passage ever begins is he's modeled what it looks like to be in the harvest. He's modeled Two things. As you read verse 35, there's two things. On the one hand, he goes from town to town, from city to city, from village to village, and he proclaims the kingdom. And and as you read other parts of scripture, what you see is Jesus proclaims the kingdom of heaven has come, repent, and believe. And this is Jesus's message all throughout the gospels. Repent and believe. He proclaims the gospel. In very simple terms, he proclaims that we are broken, that we are sinners, that we have rejected God, that we have walked our own way, lived by our own rules, done our own things. Because Jesus talks about going and teaching in the synagogues, and he goes through, as he teaches in the synagogues, he points to himself through the Old Testament. And he points to them saying, you are the nation of Israel who has rebelled who has done it your own way, who has disobeyed me, and we are the same way. But then he says, repent and believe as he proclaims the gospel. The fact that he, the God-man, came to this earth. He faced every temptation you and I face. He faced every trial, every suffering, every difficulty, every challenge we faced, yet He remains without sin. And as he lives that innocent, perfect, righteous, holy life, he was crucified. He was hung on the cross as our perfect sacrifice so that we could be put back in right relationship with God, so that we could have life, so that we could have it to the full, so that we could have purpose, so that we could have love, so that we could have assurance forever and ever that we would be with God and that God is making everything right with the world. Jesus goes from village to village and town to town and city to city, simply proclaiming that message. And the second way in which he equips us is he proclaims the gospel and he cares for people. 
It says at the end, I think it's verse 35, he says he, uh, uh, he heals the people. He meets their needs. He cares for what's going on in, in their lives. It also says that Jesus saw the crowds and he saw that they were harassed and helpless. They were thrown down. They were lost. They were vulnerable. The crowds were hopeless and had no idea where to go and what to do and where to find hope and where to find meaning and where to find life. Jesus cared for people and he healed them. And he didn't just meet their spiritual need. He helped meet their physical and their mental and their emotional and came alongside them and helped them in every corner of their lives. Jesus equips us. He looks and he goes, and he just by his own life, by his own demonstration, by the way he lives, he goes, look, I've equipped you. And he looks at his disciples and he, as he sends them out, as he, as he tells them to go out into the harvest, he doesn't tell them what to do and the disciples don't question it. Why? Because they've already been equipped. They've watched Jesus proclaim the gospel. They've watched Jesus care for people's needs and cast out demons and heal sicknesses and come alongside people and care for people and talk with people and ask questions of people. They've seen all of that. They know what to do. You and I have seen it. We don't need a 10-step program on how to do better evangelism. If you've been a believer for any period of time at all, we've heard the gospel proclaimed. We've seen Jesus do it. We've seen other people do it. We've seen Jesus care for people. We've seen other people care for people. We've been equipped for the harvest. It's a, a, it reminds me of a, a story. I had a friend several years ago. Uh, Larry was in this amazing athlete. Uh, he was, given when I knew him, he was uh, probably around 40 at the time. And he was playing hockey with guys who were 15 years younger than he was. And he was keeping up with them and was one of the best guys playing uh, on the ice. He was a phenomenal hockey player, but he wasn't just a phenomenal hockey player. Larry was a phenomenal servant. Larry was one of those guys that would give you the shirt right off of his back. He was a servant. He was a servant of servants. He helped care for people. He looked out for people. He became a deacon in our church and he would go anywhere and everywhere and fix things and help people with their lawns and do whatever was necessary and had the skills and the ability to do it. And one day he was telling me a story. His wife looked at him and goes, Larry, how in the world, you're like an IT software guy. How in the world did you learn how to fix all of these things? And Larry looked at his wife and goes, holding the flashlight. So his whole time growing up, his dad would be like, hey, I got to go fix the toilet. Here, Larry, grab the flashlight. So Larry would stand there and hold the flashlight. Or I got to fix this electrical thing. And Larry would stand there and he'd hold the flashlight. Or I've got to do this or I've got to do that. And so Larry spent his childhood holding the flashlight, just watching his dad. His dad didn't give him a manual. His dad didn't give him any further instructions. His dad didn't give him anything else. He just said, hold the flashlight. And Larry learned how to do all those different home repairs. Jesus has equipped us. He's handed us the flashlight of his word. And he said, go proclaim, go care for people. And then after he does that, Jesus sends us into the harvest. Jesus sends us to the harvest. If you actually like put your hand over top of verse 38 and you only read verse 37, verse 37 says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And if you didn't know what that next verse was, most of us in here, I definitely would think this direction. I would even suspect the disciples probably would think this, that your, your, your next answer to that question, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Okay, Jesus, tell me where to go. I'm ready to go. That's actually what Isaiah's response was. The Lord asks, who should I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. You have this, our, our initial reaction is, all right, tell us where to go. Tell us what to do. But Jesus kind of grabs us by the shirt collar and he kind of pulls us back and he kind of sits us back down and he goes, look, you need to understand something here. It's not your harvest. It's my harvest. Jesus is saying, it's my harvest. I'm the one who's bringing in this harvest. So you don't start with going. You start with prayer. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers. 
It's Jesus's harvest. He's the one who determines who comes to Christ. He's the one that determines where we should go, what we should do, what it looks like. He's the one that determines how people come to himself, not us. And more often than not, if we were to list the top 10 people in our lives that we think would come to Christ and the bottom 10 people in our lives that we think would ever come to Christ, more often than not, it's this list over here where it's the bottom 10 least likely people that we might think ever come to Christ. Those are the people who come. Because Jesus, it's Jesus's harvest. It's not ours. And so he says, pray. And then just as the disciples kind of get settled in and kind of thinking, okay, yep, yep, I can do this. I can pray for workers and I can pray for people to go out into the harvest and I can pray for this. And then in chapter 10, he immediately comes back and he, sa- and he sends out the 12 and he says, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus sends us into the harvest to do two things, to pray and to go to people, to pray and to go to people, to care for them, to proclaim the gospel to them. He calls us to pray and to go. And this idea, it's not that we pray and then we go and we stop praying or that we go and then maybe later we start praying. It's this idea of prayer and going that end up working hand in hand, that two things that work together as Jesus equips us and Jesus sends us. This idea of praying and going is is this harmonious relationship that oftentimes I tend to to split apart and I think, well, going's one thing and praying's another. But Jesus goes, no, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Now go be those laborers. And it's these two things working together. Um, I was thinking about different things that go together. And uh, uh, give or t- a, a little while ago, uh, we had one of those mornings. It was a Saturday morning, and we knew we had to be up and early that morning. We had to get to one of our kids' sporting events. We were going to have to leave really early, had a couple-hour drive to get there. So we look at all four of our kids, and we say, hey, um, tomorrow morning, uh, you are responsible for your own breakfast. So we're, nobody's, you know, mom's not prepping breakfast or anything. Y'all are responsible for your own breakfast. So we come downstairs, and, and I see one kid kids got cold pizza from the night before, and that kid's eating the cold pizza. Uh, some of you love cold pizza for breakfast. Some of you think that's disgusting. This child loved it. Uh, and then we had somebody else who had found some frozen pancakes in the freezer, and they start grabbing the frozen pancakes, and they've got it out, and they got the peanut butter on it, because we do peanut butter on everything, uh, and they've got the syrup on it, and you know, so they're, they're, they're doing well. And then I look at another child, and they're sitting there with dry Cheerios and peanut butter. Nothing else. No milk, no nothing else. I was like, what? What are you doing? And they're like, we were out of milk. I'm like, so you chose to eat dry Cheerios with peanut butter? That, how does that make sense? Like, find something else. There's got to be a better way. But if we pray without going and we go without praying, what we're doing is we're eating dry Cheerios. Cereal and milk are meant to go together. They're two things that you just don't do separately from one one another often. Uh, At least cereal you never have without milk. Or like bread and butter. Eating dry bread or straight up butter is no fun. Well, unless you're like five and then maybe straight up bread or straight up butter is good. Uh, Or steak and potatoes or so on and so on and so on. There are these two things that work together beautifully. Jesus sends us into the harvest in prayer and as we go, and he's already equipped us to go as we proclaim the gospel and as we care for people. But he calls us to go to the harvest. He calls us to go into the harvest. And what is that harvest? Chapter 10 says, as Jesus sending his disciples straight to the lost sheep of Israel. He sends them first and foremost, eventually Jesus sends them to the rest of the world. But first and foremost, Jesus sends them to the people who they interact with and they see every single day of their lives. People that they're used to interacting with, people that are normal, people that they come across, people that they interact with, people that they know. He first sends them to those people in the sphere uh, uh, of natural relationship and community in which they live. 
And so I got thinking about that. What does that mean for us? And I kind of thought of three kind of three different levels that, that our harvest and where our harvest exists. Because Jesus promises a harvest. He promises that as we go, as we proclaim the gospel, as we care for people, as we pray, that people will come to Christ. Not necessarily the people we expect, but people will come to Christ as we go into that. And so I thought of three, I thought of three places. One, I thought of our families, you know, our children, Maybe it's, maybe it's our children, maybe it's our parents, maybe it's our extended family, and it's somebody else. But this idea that as we go and we proclaim the gospel, and as we care for people, and those two things work hand in hand in our families, Jesus will bring in a harvest. He doesn't promise anything. He doesn't promise anyone, but he does promise that he'll bring in a harvest. And then the other, another, another place I thought that we can go into the harvest in is in, inside of our own church. There's people here this morning that are hurting, that are broken, that are in very difficult and challenging times. There's people here this morning who are lost and don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There's children in our church who are still trying to figure out what this whole gospel, God, Jesus, Bible thing looks like. So sitting here in the midst of our own church is another place where as we minister, as we care for, as we proclaim the gospel, as we are people who need the gospel proclaimed to us every single day, Jesus promises to bring in a harvest. And then the third one is probably the one where we most naturally think. And it's going into our community. It's going into our neighborhoods. It's talking to our neighbors uh, it's talking to our coworkers. It's building relationships and it's caring for them and it's befriending them and it's, it's talking to those that we go to school with or that we're on sports teams with or if you have kids, as your kids are involved in activities, talking to the other parents. It's these natural places that we go each day. When Jesus says, go into the harvest, he says, go where you live. Go with the people that you interact with day in and day out because he promises to bring in that harvest through every one of those circles and every one of those places. So who do we talk, I got to think about who do we talk to? So Emily, my youngest, uh, when she was a toddler, she, not much has changed in this regard, but she will talk to and would talk to anyone and everyone. If you got in the line at a grocery store and there was somebody ahead of you or behind you, she would just start talking to whichever one would actually talk to her back. And so it just didn't matter who it was. It didn't matter where it was. She would strike up conversations with anyone and everyone all the time. I think that's that kind of that idea and mentality we need to walk through life with in regard to this. Because people are hurting and people are lonely. And as you interact with people, and as you start to talk with people, they start to open up. Uh, one of the things that happens to my wife on a regular basis, an astonishingly regular basis, is uh, when she, before we moved here, she did a lot of catering. So she spent a lot of time in grocery stores and in Costco and places like that. And she regularly has had people just unload their entire lives on her. And she's like, I'm a complete stranger. And these people are talking about deep hurts and wounds and pains and struggles and difficulties that are going on in their lives. People around us are lonely and people around us need care. People around us need the gospel. They need us to proclaim it to them. So what does that look like? How do we begin to take those next steps forward? And the first thing is we equip one another. We come alongside each other. We help each other. Jesus never, ever, ever sends people out alone and says, hey, you individual, go and go all by yourself. He always sends people out in pairs. So help one another, read together, study together, pray together, encourage one another, talk to each other about different ways that you want to share the gospel with your kids or with uh, somebody else that you see as hurting in the church or outside of the church. Get in those conversations and equip one another. Help one another to do this, to proclaim the gospel. 
Because we are lost and hopeless. And God has made us for community to remind us, to point us back to himself. And he works through that. And then the second thing is look up and see people. You know, our, our, uh, our church office is in downtown Royal Oak. And it's amazing how often I walk around Royal Oak and I try to look at people as I'm walking around. And the vast majority of people are staring at the sidewalk 10 feet in front of them. People, they're just, they, they, they isolate themselves and they're hurting and they don't really want anybody else to know what's going on and what's really happening. And because they, they just, they've lost hope. They're harassed and they're hopeless, as the passage says. So see people, see people in your life and, and, and begin to identify what's going on with them. Strike up conversations, engage with them. It's amazing what people will share with you and talk with you as you begin to talk to them. And if you are scared to death to go talk to somebody and get to know somebody brand new, get some preloaded questions in your head. Get four or five things. Okay, if I'm going to, you know, I'm, 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 at a, I'm, at a, I'm at a coffee shop and I'm ordering my coffee and I'm standing there and I'm kind of trying to avoid eye contact with the barista right now because they're kind of facing this way and I'm facing that way. Kind of get in your mind, what's maybe something I could ask? Because this is the same barista that serves me, you know, multiple times a week when I come here. Get in your mind. What are some questions? What's your name? Tell us about your family. Tell us what's, you know, uh, uh, you know, what, what's been going on in life lately? And you just kind of throw out these open-ended questions. And as you do that, all of a sudden you get to know people and people start to share deep hurts and wounds. Uh, Michelle and I did this with a barista when we lived in Georgia. And there was one day, all of a sudden, we happened to be the only people there and she just unloaded on us everything that had been going on in her life. And she was, she was cussing up and down and frustrated with this and frustrated with that and just letting off steam like crazy. She gets to the end and she goes, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. And we're like, it's okay. You're, there's something going on. You're hurting. That's okay. Um, and, uh, but people desperately need that. So look up, see people, pray for people. Pray that people would come to know Christ. Pray that you and I would come to know Christ at a more deep level. Pray for opportunities and watch how God begins to just drop opportunities to proclaim the gospel, to go out into the harvest, into your life. And finally, I want to encourage you and challenge you to go. One of the most common phrases I hear in the church is, we should, we ought to, someone should, it'd be a really good idea if, and I hear all of those kind of conversations, and, and I think Jesus through this passage looks at us and goes, hey, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, go, pray for the Lord of the harvest, and go out into the harvest, and he'll work, and he'll move and go and watch and see how God begins to transform your life, how God begins to transform the lives of the people around you, how that fire begins to get lit up in you as you experience the grace and mercy and love of God and as he begins to work in the hearts and the lives of those around you. Go and watch and see what he does. Jesus is equipping us. Jesus is sending us into a harvest, his harvest, that he promises to bring in, that he brings to himself, and he uses us to go. He uses us to proclaim the gospel to people. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. It's not super complex. It's the fact that we're broken sinners in desperate need of the gospel in desperate need of new life that comes by Jesus, blood and sacrifice and the, his death on the cross and his resurrection is where that comes. Proclaim the gospel. Care for people. Look for their needs, whether it's physical or mental or emotional, simple or complex. Care for people. Pray and go and meet them and see who God is, see them for who they are and how God is working in their hearts and lives. And God promises to bring in a harvest. 
Uh, so in the last few months, we've kind of, we've gotten our youth ministry going. And, and one of the things that I realized this, just this past week, all of a sudden it hit me that every youth ministry event that we have done outside of a Sunday morning has had at least one non-New City student with us. Our students are inviting their friends and our students have invited twice as many as have come. Not everybody's responded, but our students have invited their friends and their friends have responded and come and hung out with us. And many of them have come back multiple times. And it has been so cool to see how our students have simply stepped out in faith. They've given an invitation to a friend who they look and go, hey, would love to have you get involved in the community and the church that I love and that is transforming me and I know can transform you and they're praying for them and these students are showing up and they're responding and they're coming and hanging out with us. But it's happening because our students are simply giving an invite. It's just this simple thing of inviting, of interacting with, of talking to, of going to the people that we already interact with each day and watch how God moves how God shapes, how God brings in a harvest in and through you. Let's pray.